And we're back on Fresh Waves. We're talking with Matt Passifume this morning. I'm your host, Bren Masson, and uh, we're talking about apples. So, Matt, back to the subject of just how many apples are out there. There's so many. Obviously, certain apples are better for certain things than other apples are. And um, I guess it also depends on the flavor, because a lot of people just pick up an apple and say, oh, I like the look of it, or it's the nice red one that you see sitting on the teacher's desk, which in the day, I guess, was a Macintosh. Um, what what are the different flavors? Cortland's, I think, are a little sour. Cortland's tend to be a... Um, and even in Cortland's, there's a Cortland traditional and this red Cortland, and they have a bit of a different flavor between the two of them. Okay. And the red Cortland has a thinner skin. Uh, but... There are apples that tend to be, I would say, uh, like this ginger gold, low acid, which makes the sugar in them really seem abundant, but they aren't actually that sweet. Huh. Uh, okay. You get an apple like a Macintosh, which actually has quite a bit of sugar, but quite a bit of acid. It will taste much more sour than the one we're tasting, but it actually has more sugar. Uh, hmm. You have apples that will break down quite readily when you cook them. Uh, and apples that will stay really quite firm and crunchy. Uh, Macintosh or this ginger gold will tend to go softer. Um, something like a Cortland will go softer, but a Spy or a Honeycrisp will stay quite firm. And So if you're making a pie, what would be the best pie apple? My advice to anybody making a pie is fill a bag with five different types of apple. Oh, really? Mix them up because you're going to get sweet, you're going to get sour, you're going to get firm, you're going to get soft. And it just makes the whole pie that much more interesting. Okay. That would be good advice. Yeah. Traditionally, though, the Cortland's... Traditionally, and- Cortland Spies, uh, which are funny. It's funny because those are the two sort of big bakers, but they do very different things. They're both uh, fairly high in acid, which you do want in a pie because that gives you... Uh, sort of gives you the... It makes it pop with a bit of sugar. Yeah. Uh, but the, something like a spy, which stays very firm, uh, it takes a long time to cook. Something like a Cortland actually cooks much faster. Right. And goes soft much quick, more quickly. Uh, but if you do, like I said, mix them, then you, the, you'll find the soft apples sort of slide in between and fill the, uh, fill the gaps that the firmer apples leave. Okay. So there's merit in all of them. There is. And I think, uh, variety is indeed the spice of life, right? So. Yeah. I don't uh, think I've heard of anyone really doing a lot of pie baking with Macintosh. No, we get, uh, we, we always get some that they come and they swear, you know, grandma made it with Max and mom made it with Max and now we make it with Max. And that's, that's what you grew up with, right? That's yeah, great. That's a taste that you're accustomed um, I grew to. up with, Cortland's was always the baker, yeah, but me too. now that, uh, you know, we're sort of, uh, I don't know. I I like to play around with foods and with whatever. When whenever we do make a crisp or a pie, uh, it's usually a, a collection of apples. Isn't and, that neat? Yeah, yeah, I find that really adds. Uh, the texture itself is worthwhile doing it for because it's just the. Uh, it 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 removes that uniform whatever firm or soft, and it just makes it more exciting for each bite. Yeah, and I think a lot of it is what you're accustomed to, what you grew up with. Because apples are customarily a really big part of a North American diet, especially an Ontario diet. Uh, hugely, yes. And if you go back into the, the pioneer days, the early days, early settler days, back in the 1850s, 1820s, apples were a big deal. Apple was your dessert. It was. It you was. Fry uh, it up in a frying pan till it gets nice and soft and gooey. And if you didn't have enough flour to to make an apple pie, then you were making just baked apples or cooked apples. Which I've been having for breakfast the past couple mornings, actually. They're and it's delicious, aren't they? So good. Yeah. And so simple. Yeah. How do you make yours? Okay. Well, we punch out the core. Right. So you, I don't skin them. Uh, I. My wife. <laughs> I'm taking credit here where it's not due. Um, but you punch out the core. Um, you put in some oats, uh, a dollop of butter, and some brown sugar. And okay. that's it. And you uh, you bake them as is. When they come out, uh, when they're soft, and that will, again, depend on the variety of apple you use. You know, some will be done in half an hour. Some might take an hour and a half. Right. Um when they're when they're done to the uh to the softness that you'd like and that sugar is caramelized and the butter's melted through uh fresh cream in a bowl that's it Yum. 
Yeah. Then just taste. That sounds fabulous. It's it's so simple and so, you know, you're getting you're eating first of all whole apple. You're getting yeah. some oatmeal. Mm-hmm. You're getting a lot of fat in the cream, and it's a breakfast that holds you. It does. It's delicious. Yeah. And as a dessert, my grandmother used to always say, never eat raw fruit in the evening for dessert. It's too hard to digest. And you're eating okay. it on top of the protein. And now there's science that backs up what she was saying because fruit passes through you in 20 minutes. Right. If you've already had a big protein meal that takes six hours to digest, then you've got the apple that's sitting there and actually fermenting. So it gives people bloating and this okay. gassy thing that they never knew why it happened. And it's because Weight Watchers introduced fruit as a as a dessert back in the 50s. And in fact, it's really bad to eat raw fruit after you've had a big meal. You should always eat cooked fruit because then the enzymes are already broken down and it doesn't ferment in your stomach. So it's really interesting if you have an apple pie, which is traditionally a dessert after dinner, Very all the much. fruit is cooked so it doesn't give you that bloating and it doesn't give you that uh, ugly feeling that fresh okay. fruit does. So apples, even um, as a kid, we used to just slice them up, put them in the frying pan with a bit of butter and maple syrup if we had mm-hmm. some or brown sugar toss them around till they get soft and the cortlands they get soft so fast and then you're just eating like the filling of an apple pie uh, without the pastry and it's fantastic it's so good put there, a little bit of ice cream on it yummy for all the uh the gluten uh yep, intolerant folks out there that's a uh it's an apple pie in a bowl right, right. you uh yeah you, it's ready in five minutes you throw it over ice cream it's hot it's gorgeous it's, it tastes yeah, so good so good it really is it's something that you might want to think of um throwing into your thanksgiving dinner yes yeah and then something like that it you, uh yeah. it works so well with like a roast pork as well right oh it does uh you throw uh some peaches and apples into a pan with a bit of butter and sugar and it just it makes pork come alive yeah, it does. And barbecuing. I mean, people forget that barbecuing fruit is really good. I love barbecued pineapple at the beginning of the year. That is one of my favorites. And uh, now, if you just take some apples and slice them in the round, so they're round, nice big round chunks, and put it on the barbecue, <laughs> especially yeah. on one of those baking stones, Ooh, right, yeah, it's so yeah. good. So tasty. It really is. Yeah. Huh, there you go. Okay, so tell us a bit about Honeycrisp, because I'm thinking, to me... It feels like a very modern new apple. Yet, I don't know, is there such a thing as a modern new apple? Uh, well, and again, every time you open an apple and an apple might have nine or ten seeds in it, you plant those seeds, every one of those seeds is going to be a brand new, never before seen apple. Yeah. Right? They're all, <laughs> yeah. they are all going to be a completely unique apple. So, um, we're looking at a bag of apples here. Say there's 20 apples, say that a uh, couple hundred seeds. Um, that's a couple hundred brand new apples that nobody's ever tasted. Right. Now, some of those are going to be horrific and <laughs> sour and thorny, maybe a throwback to a wild apple. Some might be really nice and most will probably be a miss. So what yeah. they do is they will literally plant thousands and thousands and thousands of seeds. Um, and wait for them to grow up. Uh, well, the, traditionally, they'd wait for them to grow up. Now they've got uh, sort of, they can sort of look inside their genome and they know what they're looking for so they okay. can see is, if this apple has potential or not. Um, and then as it grows, then they get to uh, the point where they fruit maybe, you know, six, seven, ten years down the road and they can see everything they want in an apple and they can select from there and then they sell those individual apple trees okay. or grafts off those apple trees. Now, Something like the Honeycrisp uh, was actually a chance seedling. So oh. in our orchard, every every spring, uh, there will be probably hundreds of thousands of young little apple trees re- reaching up, right? Those apple seeds from all the ones that fall on the ground, fall on the ground mm-hmm. all the apples that fall on the ground, start to grow. Now, we just go along and mow them all down because you'd have an apple forest and they'd be... It would just be solid wall of wood. You wouldn't be able to. <laughs> so we never give those apples, those seeds a chance to be, to express their potential. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's not our business. Um, but in one, uh, and the ambrosia was a, a similar story where that apple happened to grow in an orchard. 
and the farmer never really paid attention to it. It was growing in a spot that wasn't problematic, maybe where another tree had died. And it just sort of grew, grew up. And it was in a macoon orchard, I believe, for the uh, Honeycrisp. And one day the farmer just sort of like, huh, that's actually a pretty good apple. Mm-hmm, like and, that one. <laughs> yes. And started propagating it and selling the, the whips and uh, the, the young trees. And it, of course, exploded. It took off over uh, everywhere, everywhere uh, seems to be Honeycrisp. Now, right, but it wasn't that way 20 years ago. No, and it, it, was, it was hanging around in his orchard for decades. Really? Uh, just never was discovered. Um, and then from the point of discovery to the point of, uh, you know, you've, when a apple is discovered, there's a couple things that have to happen. They have to, uh, take clippings and graft them like we were talking onto roots of another apple, uh, and let them grow up into trees. And then they have to be checked to make sure there's no, viruses or anything in that apple tree itself that it's going to infect other orchards when it goes right. out. Uh, once it's all clean and healthy and they've ensured that, then, of course, it's just a matter of building up numbers. So right. they, they take the graft, and so you're a couple years there, and then all of a sudden uh, you get some out in orchards. We first planted ours 20, probably 20 years ago, and Honeycrisp was a, it was, it didn't have a name yet. It, I mean, it had a name, but nobody really knew it. Right. And, uh, and you, do, the, you still have to wait a few years once you plant it yes, for the so tree to get to maturity where you can actually harvest it. We'll plant a tree at about two years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, at about five to six years old, it will start to give you some decent fruit. At about seven or eight years old, you'll be basically into full swing. Okay. Uh, so That's kind of a uh, long turnaround. It's a long turnaround, which is um, one, of, one of the things about uh, apples is you plant an apple assuming people are going to want it in seven years. And with all these new varieties coming up, people are changing trends, right? As uh, changing their likes and dislikes. So now apples are being grown in a different style where they're growing on a wire. They grow very, uh, very small trunks. And they grow very tall, very fast because the wire is supporting them. And instead of having to grow their own trunk... They can grow hmm. almost like a grapevine. Right. Uh, and they grow these on wires, and they will produce fruit very, very quickly in a couple of years, as opposed to waiting that seven years till you had a big, sturdy trunk. And that allows... That's not really the pick-your-own world. That is more... The harvesting for world. The, exactly, yeah. for selling to stores. Uh, because they... People who are selling to stores, farmers need an apple that the stores want. And yeah. And they don't... So an apple orchard But like will that, that tree be sustainable? No. Uh, long term, that tree will, it might go 15 or 20 years and then they'll plow them all under and plant something else. Huh. They tend to sort of burn out. Whereas a, uh, a big old standard tree will go for 100, 100 plus years. Yeah. And yeah, it'll go through generations for sure. And those are the traditional apples anyway. I mean, I think t- things get trendy, don't they? And they swing over here and then they go back the other direction and then that's, they somewhere <laughs> get to the middle sometimes. That's, that's exactly what happens. You never know. Uh, and that's why it's such a big gamble for these, for people growing for stores. Mm-hmm. They don't know what the store is going to be asking for. So right, right now there's a lot of people with Honeycrisp in the ground. Hopefully people still want Honeycrisp in five years. I can't imagine that they wouldn't, but that's just my personal point of view. I love Honeycrisp. They're my favorite they're, apple in the world. They're pretty stupendous. And I think uh, the trend is more more people want Honeycrisp every year. So Yeah, I think it's pulling away from the traditional Macintosh. I find the Macintosh mushy. Yeah, no, the Mac in is... in comparison. Uh, the Mac was the gold standard. It, you know, 100 years ago, it was so much better than anything else we had. It was the Honeycrisp of its day. Yes. Yes. And very sought after. Yeah. And, and someday the Honeycrisp will be the Mac. I'm pretty sure of that. <laughs> probably. Although I don't know how you can get any crunchier and sweeter. than <laughs> You wouldn't think, would you? <laughs> no, I did, absolutely uh... not. Although this one's pretty darn close. Anyway, we're going to take a little break. When we come back, we're going to be talking wine. Wine, wine, and wine. <laughs> and apples can make wine. Who knew? You're listening to Fresh Waves, and we'll be back right after this. Stay tuned. Hey everyone, this is Lil J. Join me every Saturday night at 11 p.m. Eastern for the Block Party. 
a two-hour journey of the best in the Canadian underground dance music scene, featuring tracks and DJ mixes from Canada's emerging artists, from the disco hits of the 70s to the latest dance floor fillers. No lineups or cover charges, it's your weekly free access to the beats that are packing dance floors in Canada and around the world. The Block Party, Saturday nights at 11 p.m. Eastern, right here on 102.9 Whistle FM. Hi folks, Kim Mitchell here. You know, however you choose to get around your ATV, your snowmobile, your boat, car, if you have a motorcycle, all these things take 100% of your attention and skill to operate safely. Alcohol impairs that and bad things can happen. So, be smart, okay? You know what I'm going to say next. This message brought to you from the Safe and Sober Awareness Committee. Frost warning, and we've got a frost warning in effect for uh, last week, is what I was just saying to um, Matt on the break here. That Halliburton issued a frost warning last weekend, and this weekend it's supposed to be 27 degrees. It's a uh, that's it's just a nuts. Crazy, crazy year for sure. Yeah. So we know that there's lovely apples, and we're coming into apple season, and we really love apple season. But your farm name is Farm and Winery. So yes. you have wine, and you make wine out of apples. Now, people say to me, well, obviously, wine is from fruit, so why bother calling it fruit wine? Grapes are fruit. Well, yeah, grapes are fruit. But very rarely does a Cabernet Sauvignon have apples in it. <laughs> no, no, it's true. <laughs> it's all grapes. But So it, it is funny, and I'm not sure exactly why. Uh, Ontario seems to make the biggest distinction between grape wine and other fruits. Uh you move to BC, they seem to treat BC wine as BC wine. Right. Uh Quebec of course produces a lot of apple wine and apple cider. Do they? Well, they do. apple cider I thought, but I didn't know apple yeah. wine. Yeah, a lot of especially apple ice wine. They uh okay. or ice cider. Now we do a uh, we do a lot of apple wines. Um we do a one of my favorites is apple jack, which is a uh, bourbon. Like, yeah, like an <laughs> apple ice wine bourbon kind of a it's fantastic. Yeah. Um and we work with any of the fruits, but of course apples is a big one for us. Uh and it's such a versatile fruit to to work with. It can go anywhere from a, a pale uh delicate white to something like the Applejack, which is like a big monster, dark, mysterious uh liqueur almost. Yeah, bourbon y kind of a thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's uh it looks like trouble. It's <laughs> Yeah. And you even package it to kind of have that bad side. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that uh yeah, that old yeah, old troublemaker feel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's what we like. Um no, we uh we like to play around with all the fruits. We're um my newest is a raspberry offering, so very excited about that. Okay. It's a, uh, you know, this time of year you get the nouveaux coming out. Right. Or in a little bit. Um, the Beaujolais and exactly, things like that. Exactly, yeah, the Beaujolais and the Gamay. So we did a, uh, we did a nouveau offering and it's, uh, it's actually a nouveau's offering because it's a blend between two different types of raspberry. Uh, so it's sort of two wines, one bottle. It's so a, it's like the pink raspberries and then the red raspberries, it's right? It's the red and the purple. Oh, okay. Yes. So the, uh, the purple is that really deep. It's a, it's my favorite berry called royalty and it has, Oh, it has a totally different, doesn't necessarily taste very raspberry even. It's just, it's like rich and creamy and buttery. And then you have the raspberry, the red raspberry, which has that big, bright, uh, sharp acid. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the two together are just fantastic. So. Okay. So that's my uh, that's my latest baby. Now will that be super sweet? No, it's actually uh, only about two percent residual sugar. So just uh, wanted something that was enough. It offset the uh, offset the acidity of the raspberry, but still totally suitable for barbecue. Oh, so it's not like a sickly sweet liqueur kind of. No, thing. No, no. It uh, okay. Yeah, we do. Uh, I mean, that's where the apple jack and the ice cider fit in. You, you know, you want to do those really big sweet things, but at the same time, they're they're very limiting, right? Uh, and you're not going to sit down and have a uh, a big glass of jack with. Well, you shouldn't. Have no. A big glass of jack <laughs> <with there. laughs> 
<laughs> it uh, it might, be, might make for an early night, but... Yeah. Yeah, so we... Uh, so the know, raspberry is, is a wine. It's like a red wine. It's a, it's a off-dry red wine, yeah. I'm quite uh, quite quite pleased about it. Okay, so in the in the old, I know now they do all the grams of sugar per whatever, and I, I don't relate to the new system. But in the old system, where you had a dry, a medium, and a right. sweet, so it'd be a medium, uh, which would be the old system. You quite often saw numbers one, two, three, four, five, right? Something. And now they've moved to grams per liter. The old system was sort of based on that. Most it was sort of in terms of percentage, right. so. One percent, two percent, three percent sugar. Um, so this is about two, two and a half percent sugar. So about twenty grams per liter. Mm. So some sweetness, but certainly not sweet. Right. Um, a red wine is generally, you know, three five in that range. Maybe as high as ten for some of the sweeter, fruitier reds. Right. And then a dry is a zero or a one. Is a a dry, which would be considered a zero. Zero uh, percent, so it's less than ten grams of residual sugar, right? right? Or yeah, probably less than five grams if you're rounding down. Yeah. Is there such a thing as a fruit wine wine with that kind of a sugar rating? There is uh, apples. You can do it with some apples. Um, what I find with when you when you finish a wine really really dry, mm-hmm. and you consume every every gram of sugar that the fruit had to offer, your You'll smell it and you get the fruits in the nose, but your palate doesn't perceive the fruit if it's 100% dry. Right. You don't taste that fruit. So by leaving a little sugar behind, um, you it tastes like the fruit. So depending on what you're looking for, sometimes you want a wine that is just a dry white. Mm-hmm. And so we'll ferment a, an apple pretty much to the end. Uh, but if you want to really taste that apple or really taste that raspberry, you have to leave a little uh, residual sugar behind. Right. Now, I I find your apple ice wine is dessert in a glass. Oh, very much, yes. It lasts for a long time. <laughs> oh, it lasts forever. And again, uh, that has to do with a couple things. It A, you don't drink it too quickly. Right. <laughs> B, the, uh, the sugar and acidity that are left, because it is a made from frozen apples, mm-hmm. you're pulling all the water out of those apples in the form of ice. You're really only expressing, uh, the acids, the flavor compounds, and the sugars in the apple. So in, even by the time it's fermented, we're still about 23, 24% residual sugar. So that's 23, 230 grams per liter. Wow. So you're almost a cup of sugar in a liter of wine. Now, that's not added in any way. That's 100% from the apple. Right. Uh, but just to give you an idea of how sweet that is, <laughs> you're almost taking a cup of sugar and pouring it into a big bottle, right? It's, it's like, wow, that's a lot of sugar. Yeah. Um, not quite Coca-Cola sweet, but it's it's getting there. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, again, it's one of those things, if people are having guests over, you can serve something as plain as ice cream with a shot of that on top, oh. Oh, it's to die it's for. It's magic, yeah. It's really good. And because it, uh, because it, you concentrate the entire apple, it stays in balance, and it right. doesn't taste overly sweet. It's, no, you have all the acid, you have all those flavors that are just everything's amped up that to that uh, that higher degree, mm-hmm. and as a result, I think it gives a little bit gives a lot of a lot of grat or a lot of gratification, right? Right. And I think, uh, you know, after dinner, when a lot of people are sitting around having their liqueurs and stuff, the things that I don't drink, I'll have my little bit of ice wine. Yes. Yeah. And it's a sippy thing. It's not a glunk glunk. It's a sippy sippy. No, (laughs) it it hits your mouth. Your, uh, your salivary glands just sort of go nuts with all the, uh, all the intensity and it's, yeah, you can taste it for a couple minutes and then you have another sip. Yeah. And it's just it's, fantastic. It's really, really good. Anyway, something to think about for people out there. Now, you have that one thing that I buy by the caseload. The the hop damper. The, yeah, it's or, the wild fire or whatever oh, it is. Oh, sorry. The, the, uh, the, yeah, the, the smoking spicy apple. One. Smoke and apple. That's yes. what it's called. Smoke so, and apple. Smoke and apple is, of course, our apple ice wine. The exact same as our apple ice wine, although it tastes like a completely different animal. Because it has spices in it. It's- it is loaded. And if you saw the uh, the number of actual chilies that go into a vat, it's incredible. Uh, but we we produce our... We have sort of... Uh, there's sort of like three siblings. Our apple jack, our ice cider, and our smoking apple. 
they all start out life in the same uh, in the same bins of apples. They're all crushed and frozen at the same time. Uh, we make our apple jack one way. We uh, we make our ice cider another, and then once the ice cider's made, we divide it again. And to the finished ice cider, we add a staggering number of uh, assorted chili peppers. Yes. And that's kind of fun, right? Getting to choose what spices or peppers you want to use in there. Um, as well as mixed peppercorns. So you're getting two very distinct burns. Uh, but that heat is really offset by the, again, the staggering amount of chili that's in there. Or, sorry, the staggering amount of sugar that's in there. Yeah. So you don't taste it as overly sweet and you don't taste it as overly hot. But it's, it's fantastic. Intense. Oh, caramelized onions in that is the so best good. thing you've ever had. And I, I make a baked chicken with that sauce. And it is, people are always saying, what's in there? It's so good. <laughs> my secret. That's my secret recipe. <laughs> now, I was turned on to a, uh, a chocolate sauce made with that. Wow. Oh, we've got to get that recipe going. You know what? Dead simple. It's a uh, one to one. Okay. You, so you take a hundred gram chocolate bar, uh, dark chocolate. To 100 milliliters of smoking apple. So one to one, whatever you've got in grams of chocolate, down. same milliliters of, uh, and put it in a double boiler. And it just, oh, it's amazing. It, uh. Oh my. The, well, you have to agree to come on again in, in the fall, late in the fall. Because you guys are open till we're open till Christmas. Absolutely. You're open till yeah. Christmas. So these are some interesting things that people can look at for gifting. You know, you go to a, somebody's house with ye old regular bottle of red wine, and they get six of those. You come yeah. with an Applewood Winery fruit wine, and there's what's this? And there's a conversation about it. And I have a friend who is a bourbon fanatic, and for his birthday, we gave him a bottle of Applejack. Nice. And explained how you jack the apples and everything. And so that's will give some people something to look forward to. You're going to come back on again? Yes. When the apple season has uh, dwindled a bit. <laughs> and uh, come and talk to us about all the wines and uh, the options for a really unique hostess gift at Christmas time. It, it really is a great thing to take to someone's house. It. Uh, I love showing up with a bottle of... Applewood or any other really small winery that is not available in the LCBO because, yes. first of all, it catches people's attention. And it's unique. Yeah, it's unique. And if you put a bottle of uh, mead or apple wine or raspberry wine or whatever on the table and there's it's on there with six cab soves or pinots, or, I can guarantee you it's going to be the first one drained only because everybody is curious about it. And everyone wants to try Yeah, everybody wants to try it, right? So it's nice to... Uh, to at least not have your bottle go to waste. Terrific. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, Matt. Always it's a always pleasure. a pleasure to have you on the show, and we always learn so much. Um, how do people get a hold of you, and where do they find you? All right. Uh, the best way to get a hold of me is right through our uh, website, www.applewoodfarmwinery.com. Yep. Uh, and, of course, I'm at the winery Wednesday through Sunday, uh, right through apple season, and then uh, Thursday through Sunday, right through to Christmas. Perfect.